what cigarettes mean to women. That in a democratic society, everything depends on the consent of the people. We have a problem. We're losing half the market in America because there is a taboo against women smoking. Welcome to the Rich Havit channel. Today, we're going to discuss the transformative life of Edward Bernays, the unsung architect of modern consumerism, and we're immersing ourselves in a vivid scene from 1929. Picture this. It's a brisk Easter Sunday, and we're right in the heart of New York City's annual Easter parade. However, the talk of the crowd isn't the parade itself or the delightful spring weather. It's something more scandalous. The audacious idea of women smoking cigarettes. It may sound absurd, but in the 1920s, female smoking was a significant taboo associated with corruption, prostitution, and social outcasts. The stigma was so intense that several U.S. states even attempted to outlaw women's smoking. Then, in a plot twist worthy of Hollywood, a group of stylish debutantes emerges mid-parade, strutting in and, to everyone's surprise, lighting up cigarettes right in front of everyone, defiantly branding these cigarettes as torches of freedom. However, here's the twist. It wasn't a genuine protest or a heartfelt rebellion. While it certainly seemed that way to onlookers and dominated newspaper headlines the next day, only a handful of people knew that this was a theatrical spectacle orchestrated by one man to meet his client's demands. That client happened to be none other than Big Tobacco, specifically Lucky Strike. It wasn't a protest at all. It was pure propaganda. And who was the mastermind behind this deception? None other than Edward Bernie's, a name you'll discover is responsible for shaping modern-day consumerism. He's likely the most influential person you've never heard of. Today, we unravel the story of how this young immigrant in the advertising world manipulated millions of people into spending money on things they didn't want, thereby inventing the field of public relations and influencing the world around you in ways you might not even imagine. Our tale commences in Toledo, Ohio, in the year 1917. The atmosphere is subdued as the Grand Opera House's velvet curtain opens, revealing the enchanting voice of Enrico Caruso, an Italian opera sensation guided to international stardom by his astute agent. This agent, an Austro-Hungarian immigrant named Edward Bernies, boasts a lineage that would captivate anyone intrigued by human psychology, his uncle none other than Sigmund Freud, the father of psychoanalysis. Bernies, leveraging his cunning, is propelling Caruso to stardom by generating interest in the mysteriously beautiful voice, orchestrating public antics to protect it. However, on the fateful night of April 2nd, 1917, Bernays' life takes an unforeseen turn. Simultaneously, 300 miles away in Washington, D.C., President Woodrow Wilson announces a world-defining declaration, the U.S. is entering World War I to fight against Austria and Germany. War propaganda is set to dominate conversations, and Bernays, with his unique skill set, is among the propagandists summoned by the U.S. government. Joining the Committee of Public Information, Bernays is tasked with selling America's war motives domestically and abroad. President Wilson, impressed by Bernays' execution and ideas, invites the 26-year-old to join him at the Paris Peace Conference after the war. The reception Wilson receives in Paris astonishes even Bernays. Crowds throng the streets to catch a glimpse of their hero, the great liberator President Woodrow Wilson. Observing this impact, Bernays contemplates whether these techniques could be harnessed not just during times of war, but also in times of peace. However, there's a hitch. The term propaganda is tainted in America, carrying a negative connotation associated with German war efforts. Undeterred, the resourceful Bernays refuses to let semantics thwart his ambitious plans. All he needs is a new term, and thus, public relations is born. After the war, Edward Bernays returned to New York City. The wartime experience had transformed Bernays, boosting his confidence in his abilities while also deepening his conviction that people were, in his own words, stupid dopes or sheep. Armed with this newfound conviction, a somewhat diminished view of human intellect and a freshly coined phrase to describe his work, 
he established the first ever public relations consultancy, making his puppet mastermind skills available for business. Bernays reached out to his uncle, Freud, presenting him with a rare box of Havana cigars. In return, Freud reciprocated with a copy of his latest book on psychoanalysis. Intrigued by Freud's insights into the human subconscious, irrationality, and the inherent human drive for desire, Bernays saw these concepts as pivotal in influencing the growing crowds in the newly established big city landscape, marking a new era in American history. Meanwhile, the American corporate landscape was undergoing its own significant evolution. The post-war period ushered in a rapid era of industrialization, with machines taking on more tasks. Companies were now producing goods at an unprecedented pace, bringing about efficiencies but also stoking fears among corporate leaders of potential overproduction. Overproduction, an economic term, refers to a situation where the supply of goods and services surpasses the demand. This imbalance can lead to a decline in prices, eroding profit margins, and leaving producers with unsold stock. In severe cases, it can contribute to economic downturns. Corporate America was deeply concerned about the potential consequences of overproduction, grappling with a challenging dilemma. How could they maintain active factories, busy workers, and soaring profits if Americans only purchased what they truly needed? The urgent need arose to shift society from a needs-based culture to a wants-based culture. In the words of investment banker Paul Mazar of Lehman Brothers, the imperative was clear. We must shift America. We must make Americans more conscious of style. People must be trained to desire, to want new things even before the old have been entirely consumed. As the 20th century unfolded, a new social and economic order emerged, consumerism. This concept advocated for the continual acquisition of goods and services, asserting that an individual's well-being, happiness, and social standing were intricately linked to their capacity to consume. Consumerism posited that consumer spending was the engine of economic growth. While the term consumerism gained prominence in the 20th century, its roots can be traced back to 1899. Thurston Felblin, a political economist and critic of capitalism, introduced early analyses of this concept. Felblin theorized that conspicuous consumption became a way of signaling one's socioeconomic status, with people owning and using products not just for their utility, but as symbols of prestige and affluence. In his book, The Theory of the Leisure Class, Felblin also laid the groundwork for the economic phenomenon known as Veblen goods. As America undergoes this transformative period, it becomes evident that Edward Bernays is leading the charge. His selection for this role wasn't arbitrary. It was rooted in the insights he gleaned from his uncle's work. Bernays stood out among other propagandists because he grasped a crucial concept. The art of selling products wasn't merely about listing their features. It was about evoking emotions. Contrary to prevailing beliefs among marketers at the time, who thought detailing a product's functionalities was the most compelling approach, Bernays disagreed. He dismissed the notion that utility alone motivated purchases. Bernays' distinctive approach is succinctly captured by one of his former employees, Peter Strauss, who noted, Eddie Bernays saw that the way to sell a product was not to sell it to your intellect. You should buy this automobile, but rather, you would feel better if you had this automobile. Bernays recognized that people weren't just exchanging money for products. They were investing a part of themselves in the process. He became the master of crafting desire, building emotional connections to purchases. Enough with the philosophy in practical terms, what did Bernays actually do? During this period in American history, one of the industries grappling with the fear of overproduction was the burgeoning automobile industry. Mass production of cars had only begun in the 1890s, a couple of decades before the war. By 1924, despite cars becoming more sophisticated than ever, they had saturated the market. Almost everyone who needed a car already had one. Selling more cars to a population that didn't necessarily need them posed a challenge. The idea of one household owning more than one car seemed ludicrous reserved for the mega-rich. 
Edward Bernays played a pivotal role in reshaping the marketing strategy for car companies. He suggested marketing cars not as mere utilities, but as symbols of male sexuality, giving rise to long-body luxury sedans and sports cars. Taking it a step further, Bernays advised General Motors to generate further demand by introducing new annual designs, birthing the practice later termed planned obsolescence. This strategy aimed to create a desire for the latest symbols of male vitality each year. While Ford was the largest car manufacturer in the United States at the time, producing over half of all cars on the road, Henry Ford opposed the concept of planned obsolescence. He believed it led to poor engineering and was unethical. Despite Ford's resistance, consumers were captivated by Bernays' Freudian tricks, and General Motors surpassed Ford in sales over the next decade, claiming its spot as America's largest automobile manufacturer. The annual design upgrades, originally introduced by Bernays, have since become synonymous with the automobile industry. Bernays' influence extended beyond cigarettes and cars. He touched every aspect of social life. He pioneered the concept of product placement in film and television and was the first to employ psychologists to produce reports asserting that specific products were beneficial for people. One notable example is his work with the Beechnut Packing Company, where he aimed to increase bacon sales using these innovative strategies. Bernays' impact on shaping public perception and consumer behavior left an indelible mark on various industries. The question of how Americans decide what to eat becomes more intriguing when we consider who dictates those choices. Edward Bernays explored this concept by approaching his personal physician with an idea. He posited that since the body digests a significant portion of its calorie intake during sleep, waking up in a calorie deficit could be remedied by consuming a larger breakfast. Contrary to current knowledge, Americans at the time generally ate a small breakfast, often comprising carbs with juice or coffee. However, Bernays convinced his physician to endorse this viewpoint. To amplify the impact, Bernays asked his physician to survey 5,000 colleagues across the country, inquiring if they also agreed with the argument. Of the responses, 4,500 physicians concurred, and Bernays publicized these findings, declaring that thousands of physicians agreed that a heavier breakfast was healthier and that breakfast was the most crucial meal of the day. Simultaneously, he strategically planted stories promoting eggs and bacon as ideal breakfast staples. The American breakfast, influenced by Bernays' propaganda, gained widespread popularity. In the 1920s, Bernays played a crucial role in shaping modern fashion consumerism, Motivated by banks seeking to evolve the ideology of American shoppers, he promoted the concept of department stores. Hosting fashion shows with celebrity clients giving speeches, Bernays conveyed the idea that clothing was more than fabric and thread. It was a means of expressing unique magical characteristics. This approach, using celebrity endorsements to communicate the desirability of certain clothing lines, played a significant role in establishing the role of modern apparel brands. Beyond fashion, Bernays directly influenced it. Lucky Strike, the cigarette brand behind the Torches of Freedom propaganda, approached Bernays with a unique problem. Despite successfully transforming women into a new class of smoking citizens, focus groups revealed that women were choosing other cigarette brands over Lucky Strike due to their green and red boxes clashing with fashion trends. In line with the prevailing norms of his time, Bernays proposed a seemingly simple solution to a problem faced by Lucky Strike. Change the packaging of their cigarette boxes to something more fashionable. However, the head of Lucky Strike staunchly opposed this idea, citing the substantial investment made in their current branding and marketing efforts, totaling millions of dollars. Instead, they challenged Bernays to make the color green more fashionable. Undeterred, Bernays orchestrated the Green Ball, an extravagant affair with a star-studded guest list extensively covered by the press. The event showcased beautiful green artifacts and decorations strategically placed throughout the venue. Intellectuals spoke passionately about the historical virtues and poetic interpretations of the color green. 
This unconventional approach successfully transformed green, initially an unpopular color, into a fashionable and desirable choice. Even before the green ball took place, newspapers fueled the suspense, heralding how green was becoming the latest trend among high society in New York. Bernays' work with the green ball epitomizes an economic concept known as market expansion theory. By redefining social norms and influencing fashion trends, Bernays expanded the market for Lucky Strike, increasing demand for the green and red packaging. The economic implications of market expansion theory lie in its potential to create new economic opportunities, spur industry growth, and drive increased consumer consumption, contributing to significant economic expansion and enhanced profits. Bernays' astute strategies were undeniably effective in achieving their intended impact. Americans underwent a transformation into consumers, much to the delight of corporate America. Their straightforward plans involved stoking the flames of consumerism and expanding into a more innovative, profitable, and distinctly American future. Corporations and banks engaged in extensive borrowing, fueled by an enthusiastic attitude of full steam ahead. Consumerism was riding high, propelling one of the grandest stock market rallies in history. Notably, Bernays played a part in popularizing retail investing, convincing the masses that investing was a patriotic act and owning a piece of the American economy was a birthright. This compelling message triggered a rush of Americans buying stocks, predominantly from banks associated with Bernays. However, history has a way of reminding us of our limitations, and Bernays encountered a form of irrationality he couldn't comprehend in late October 1929. Organizing a massive event in New York City to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the light bulb's invention, the gathering was a homage to American capitalism and consumerism. Tens of thousands of Americans and influential figures attended at Bernays' behest. Unfortunately, as the celebration unfolded, chilling news spread. The U.S. stock market was collapsing. The overconfidence stemming from consumerism and industrialization had led to a mass delusion and the Great Depression began, wiping away Bernays' achievements. The aftermath saw a quarter of America's workforce losing their jobs, halting the spending spree. Americans were no longer compelled to buy unnecessary items, signaling what seemed like the end of Bernays' era. However, his influence persisted. After the Great Depression, Bernays managed to regain and even amplify his influence and power. So, here is the transformative life of Edward Bernays, the unsung architect of modern consumerism. Like, share, and subscribe to the Rich Havit channel for more captivating stories that unveil the hidden threads shaping our world.